You might be wondering why I'm using a space theme for this presentation. I realize the topic has nothing to do with NASA, science, or astronauts. But here's my rationale. This week we're looking at improving programs of study, fields of study, and courses of study. In the most general sense, we are discussing how to improve the curriculum, but just at different points on a continuum. The next question on your mind, because it was on my mind too, is why these particular vantage points? Simply put, we're starting with a macro view of curriculum and magnifying it to the micro or street level. This will make more sense on the next slide. It's also important to notice that I used the word improve, not design. As your authors point out, it's somewhat rare for anyone to have the opportunity to design a new program of study for the school or school district. It is more likely that you are going to participate in updating one of the levels of curriculum than start from a blank piece of paper. So we'll look at the strategies that are used to improve programs, fields, and courses in the remainder of this presentation. So let's begin. Imagine that there was a continuum from the top left corner of this slide to the bottom right corner of the slide. When we look at programs of study, fields of study, and then at a course of study, we're simply looking at the curriculum from three different perspectives, or we're using three different lenses to examine the curriculum. The broadest view would be the program of study. In this view, you're looking at all the lear learning activities at a specific level, elementary, middle, or secondary. It's this, similar to the view of Earth from the International Space Station, and you can make out in this little picture at the top left, the country of Italy from a nighttime view of it from the space station. A field of study is a closer view of the curriculum because you're looking at one particular grade level or subject area. For example, you're looking at third grade or you're looking at English at, uh, say, the high school level. It would be similar to the view you might get from an airplane that is about to land. So here you see in the middle picture, we're flying over the city of Tokyo. And that big red and white tower there in the picture is called the Tokyo Sky Tree. And you can see it much closer uh, in a picture as you're beginning to land at uh, Tokyo's Narita International Airport. The third perspective is the closest view, that of a particular course within a grade level, such as fourth grade math. By comparison, this view would be what you would see when you walk down a sidewalk while you're talking or taking a walk. The closer that you get to the sidewalk, the more details that you can see. And so you can even see the lines or the bricks that, that comprise the, the sidewalk. And so when we look at a particular course, we're taking one of the closest views of curriculum that we can possibly take. A program of study refers to the entire set of learning experiences at a particular level of schooling. This level would be elementary, middle, or secondary. It's not looking at a particular grade level or a subject area, but the entire school. This was hard for me to get my head around the idea the first time I heard it. Maybe the examples might make it a little bit more clear what's happening when we're looking or trying to improve a program of study. Think about the pacing guides or the curriculum guides at your school. Even though they are organized by grade level and by subject, the entire curriculum guide contains all of the learning experiences for a particular school level. You ask the question, why update a program of study? Oftentimes, school districts want to change the focus of schooling. Remember that the authors of the course textbook identified three purposes for schooling. As those purposes change or are redefined uh, by schools, we must also change the programs that we've implemented to align with those new purposes. Now, I've listed three very common reasons why programs are updated. First, there is an initiative to make schooling more student-centered. Administrators want the teaching and learning to be more sensitive to the needs of the students. A second reason, new textbooks are adopted, which means that the curriculum guides and pacing guides must be updated. Third, shifting the assessment of learning from, say, isolated assignments and 
and tests to a project-based learning system, which is more rigorous, relevant, and authentic. There are other reasons to be sure, but these are some of the most common. Before looking at the process, I need to make two comments. First, improving programs is usually performed by a team of educators. These are not parents or important stakeholders. The curriculum development team is composed of educators, classroom teachers, central office staff, subject area experts, and administrators who have a functional understanding of curriculum and how it works. Parental involvement is necessary in so many areas, but this happens to be one where there their participation is not helpful. The people involved must have detailed knowledge and understanding of subjects. They also need to know about instructional strategies and how to design learning experiences that measure the amount of learning taking place. Unfortunately, most parents just do not have this kind of knowledge or preparation. My second comment relates to the improvement process itself. It's not well defined. It's not a linear process, nor is it sequential. The best description I can give you is that it's cyclical and it's process oriented. As a matter of fact, I think it's a, a process of processes. The team decides where to begin the process and in most cases this will involve gathering data but even once the data is gathered there may be other areas that are, are looked at and we'll, we'll kind of bring this out in, in the later slides. To improve a program of study, as with a, a field of study, there needs to be some data on which to base the rationale for change. Programs of study do not need to be changed for the sake of change. Needs analysis provides the necessary data to justify improving or changing the program of study. This can include reviewing standardized test scores, uh, stakeholder surveys of satisfaction, and even te teacher perceptions, just to name three. But an analysis of that data Data, the gathering of the data needs to take place so that you know exactly where you need to start with the refinement of the program of study. Improving a program of study is not dependent upon following a particular model. It is a series of processes and as you will see each of these areas that might need improvement are unique and will require a unique process to complete the improvement. This is where the curriculum development team is vital. Once the data has been gathered and has been analyzed, it's up to the team to identify an area to improve. They will also have to determine the best steps to take to improve that data, that area. And here are a list of some of the programmatic improvements that need to be made. For example, after you've conducted your, your needs assessment, you find that the pacing guides need to be implemented. That You're not using pacing guides, so that needs to be an area uh, of focus. Maybe you're going to focus on critical thinking. Uh, or as some school districts have recently, you're going to uh, teach to fidelity and that's a whole philosophic change uh, that needs to take place. Uh, possibly you're, you're going to focus on uh, improving the assessments, you know, teacher-driven assessments or standardized assessments. You want to bring that in. Maybe you're going to go to a formative assessment uh, model rather than just a, a summative one. Uh, a big area that tends to show up on these programmatic types of uh, refinements is improve low-performing schools. Now just think about that as an area for improvement. That's a broad area, which Remember, programs of study are your broadest area. And where to start improving low-performing schools? What do you start with? Do you focus on hiring better teachers? Do you focus on discipline? Uh, do you focus on the curriculum itself? Maybe changing the curriculum, make it a student-centered curriculum. You see, there's just a whole host of things so that one model is not going to help you to uh, figure out what to do to improve the study. So what you base it on is you create the, the assessment, the needs assessment, you analyze the data, and then you prioritize the data and say, okay, based on our survey of, of teachers, students, parents, and based on the test scores that we have, uh, we need to focus on uh, making the curriculum more relevant, or we need to focus 
focus on critical thinking skills and math, uh, whatever it may be. And, and so the prioritization comes from that curriculum development team. They identify the area, and then you take the steps necessary to uh, accomplish that, that refinement. So when we look at fields of study, and we're taking a little bit closer view of the curriculum, we're going to focus on one subject area across several grade levels. So we'll look at social studies, or we'll look at science across grades 3, 4, and 5. Now there is a sequential model for improving a field of study and it involves the nine steps that you see listed here. It requires that teachers determine what needs to be changed and what the new field will cover. Then solicit the buy-in from the rest of the staff for the change. That's the orientation for mastery because you're going to look at what standards to select and, and then identify those standards clearly and get people to agree that these are the standards that you're going to, to have taught at the school. The third step involves developing a curriculum map. And if you do a search on curriculum maps, you're going to find hundreds of them out on, on Google. And I, I use them, and remember I taught a seminar last year in the Philippines on curriculum mapping because it's becoming a very important uh, aspect of uh, developing curriculum, is to identify what is going to be taught when it's going to be taught and for how long. And so with the maps that I provided them, and, and I'm partial to these these maps, is it identifies the, the topic, the content, the standard that's going to be taught. It's also going to identify what part of the school year it's going to be taught in and uh, how long you're going to teach it, how many days are you going to be addressing a standard. Now I added to mine a, a column for uh, assessments to be used. How are you going to measure that standard? Is it an assignment? Is it a test? And uh, you know, a map is is not kind of what you think of a, of a road map as much as it's just a chart that says, okay, on day one of the school year, I'm going to introduce this uh, this topic, and I'm going to spend three days on the topic, and then uh, go on to the next one. And with a curriculum map, it's not something that you uh, plan to do, but it's more of what you've done. So you really have to base it on a year's worth of experience. And this is what I told the Filipinos. I said, okay, for the first year, develop a map that you think you would use. I mean, based on how long you're going to teach these uh, standards. In your map, you need to account for any holidays when students aren't going to be present so that you can carry over the, the content. Then at the end of the year, you need to review your map again to see if you did indeed spend the, the number of days you thought you would spend on it and, and make adjustments. So really, that's what the curriculum map is. It's, it's supposed to be uh, not a, a forward-looking document as it is a backwards-looking document based on what you ha have already done in the past. But if you've never used them, then you need to, need to have at least one where it says, this is what I plan to do. Uh, and the fourth step in improving a field of study, of course, is to refine the map. Well, the only way you can refine it is you have to implement it. You have to use it. You have to, to start to see where things are. Maybe you have to adjust the sequencing of the content, increase the number of days or decrease the number of days. That all is part of the map. It's a living document for that year because it is um, something that's going to be subject to change as conditions change. And even once you have finished it and you, you feel like it's, it's a, a great representation of what's done, things change. Different classes come in, so you're constantly revising the map. But basically, the purpose of a map is to help someone navigate through the curriculum. And they're great for new teachers uh, to have a map that has been implemented because then they can kind of see, okay, I, I need to spend no more than two days on this, this particular standard and then move on to the next. Uh, 
Item number five here is to develop curriculum materials. And, and this really involves the... Uh, the handouts, the worksheets, the study guides, the uh, any, any of the documents that you would use to teach the standards on the uh, curriculum. And, and really, uh, I, I think of learning activities too, any games that you're going to play, any manipulatives that would be something the students would work with, then, then they'd be all part of those curriculum resources. If there's a video or uh, a website that you want them to go to, that should be listed there. Now. Item six suggests time allocations. I put that in with the curriculum map. I don't. I, I create that as. I, I see that as part of the same process of uh, developing a curriculum map. So, uh, yeah, basically just saying how many days you're going to spend on the the topic. Uh, then step seven is once you've identified the content, then you identify the tests, assessments that you're going to use uh, to measure the learning. Uh, don't be afraid to try some projects out and. Of just the paper pencil test and in some unique ways. Let students decide how they want to tell you what they've learned. Step eight requires that you identify the instructional materials, and this again would be any charts that you're going to use. Uh, it could be videos too, uh, books that you're going to use to have the students read, uh, any manipulatives that you're going to use. Uh, the last step involves professional learning because as with new fields of study or updated fields of study people need to increase their capacity to teach it so they might need uh, some professional development on using some of the curricular resources or the instructional materials so that everybody can uh, adequately implement the curriculum map. So that's updating a field of study using this nine-step process. It's not the only one, but it, the, the only model, for instance, but it is, I, I think, a very useful model. Here's an example of how some school districts have uh, refined a field of study. And typically when, when school districts undertake this process of improving fields of study, such as English across several grade levels, they attempt to break down some of the grade level barriers. I mean, even to the point where they might kind of eliminate the discipline specific rigidity and integrate the curriculum across subject areas, you know, bringing math into English. What happens is usually they go to a non grade specific curriculum. And here's how this works. Modules are created and and students are then completing these modules in a, in a sequence or they may be an elective type module where they can take them in any order and when the student completes one module they move on to the next. Often to accomplish this goal they use two options. The first option is a diagnostic prescriptive model, and you'll see that in your book, where basically you determine the present level of achievement and prescribe module or the placement, the proper placement. You might remember the old SRA reading uh, curriculum. It was a box full of short stories and it focused on reading comprehension, reading fluency, vocabulary, and a host of other things. And what happened is the students took a diagnostic reading test at the beginning, and it showed them where they placed in the SRA curriculum. And then they started with that color, because remember, SRA was broken down by color. They started with that color, and, and each of the colors had, I don't remember how many different stories, but I think there was like 20 or 27 stories in each section and the student was to read through those stories completing the work and they would take a test and if they passed the test they went on to the next module when they finished that module then they went on to the next color and and progressed all the way through it and it increased vocabulary as well as fluency and comprehension I think it's a great program I used it myself as a child and when I was teaching in the early 80s I, I used it uh, there and, and I thought it was a great program but it is a diagnostic prescriptive type curriculum you 
give an assessment to see where the students are and then you prescribe that level that they would start out at. The next option is an elective option and basically uh, the faculty gets together and they create a series of electives and uh, basically students choose which elective that they're interested in and it can be again along the lines of a particular subject area English and uh, then students take the, the, the course, it, it may be an eight week elective or an 18 week or a nine week depending on how, how your school is organized. And there are assignments and assessments and when they've completed that elective they can take a, another one. And, and some schools have used this in place of the regular curriculum and in other schools they have done this as an addition to the curriculum so it can kind of be either either option. So that's uh, an option that kind of gives students a lot of control over what they're taking and they, they choose the electives based on their own interests. Now a third option or approach which is separate from the two that I've listed here stays within a graded system. So in other words we don't do away with a graded system maybe it's a compromise of the two and it's a teacher centered approach in approving fields of study. For this to work, teachers review the data about the effectiveness of their instruction and then they analyze where the weaknesses are located and they prescribe modifications to the curriculum. This can include shifting content from one grade level to another. It can include resequencing the content so the flow is more natural. In the first step, they clarify what concepts need to be covered and in what order they should be covered. Step two, the teachers design units of, units of instruction. These units are framed by essential questions. The final step involves identifying the research-based instructional strategies to use. A toolbox of strategies are created and teachers are given the freedom to choose the best tool for their particular work. So these are three approaches to designing a, a field of study that are each a little bit different but allow lots of flexibility. To refine a course of study, you'll find here the uh, model is very similar to that of a field of study. It has eight steps in the process and begins with identifying the course parameters. Now, in the course parameters, we're looking at the objectives of the course, you know, what needs to be covered, what content is a part of this course. And then the second step involves an assessment of the students. What standards have they already mastered? Uh, what uh, areas are they showing deficits in? And from that, uh, we refine the course objectives to, to meet the needs of students. Because obviously, if the students have already mastered content, then there's no reason to put it in a new course. So you create the, the course of study, the new course, by uh, looking at what standards normally are covered in this course and assessing where students are typically at and then refining those course objectives. Step four involves the sequencing of the objectives. Again, this is basically creating a curriculum map. And if you do that, it really takes care of uh, at least steps three and four. And I, it certainly identifies the the time that you would need it. And, and go back to, to what I said about curriculum mapping. That would happen here with a course of study as well. Step five, create the learning activities. What, what students are going to be doing in order to progress through the class. How they're going to measure, uh, how you're going to measure the learning that's taking place. So what activities are they going to do? What projects are they going to do? Assignments and uh, again, be creative. If you're creating a new course, then then don't just do the same old thing while you're going to do the chapter exercises. You know, make it uh, more real world oriented. You know, very rarely do we in the real world complete worksheets. Uh, have them do things that have value in the real world. Uh, as you're creating this new course or updating an older course. Step six involves creating the instructional materials that you would be using. 
manipulatives, demonstrations, lab experiences, whatever they may be. That's really at this point, once you've identified the objectives to be taught, then you're at a place where you can uh, identify any of the materials that you're going to use to teach the content. Step seven is to define the assessment measures, your tests that you're going to use, uh, whether they're standardized or whether they're uh, teacher created, are they uh, formative, or are they going to be e the summative, evaluative. Step number eight involves creating a curriculum guide and this is critical so that once uh, you've identified all of this and created these materials, the guide is something that other teachers would use who have never taught this course before as it tells them exactly what's happening. It's not the teacher edition of a textbook, but it even goes much further so that they can make the course their own. And that's what I think is the beauty of a curriculum guide is it allows teachers the freedom to exercise their own creativity and that's what you want. Uh, you don't want them doing cookie cutter courses. You want their own uniquenesses to flow through the course. And the guide does that. It's not a book of commands. It's a book of suggestions. Now the standards are, are going to be required, and so I should say it's a little bit more than just a, a suggestion. You're going to have identified standards, but how you teach those and how you assess those, they're going to have that in the guide as a series of options. Tools in a toolbox, I like that metaphor because uh, everybody can can complete the same goal but they may use different tools to get there and that's the beauty of this this particular model. In contrast to the technological approach that I was just talking about, there is a naturalistic approach and it begins by asking the question, do we really need this course? And I think this is phenomenal. is because often as we assume that the only way to deal with new content or updating content is, oh, we're going to create a course for this. Maybe what we need to do is to improve an existing course instead of creating a new one. Let's just take the course we have and, and rev it up a bit. Or maybe what we need to do is identify where the information uh, not presently covered in the curriculum could be taught. So maybe it needs to be done at a different level, a different agency. Or we might need to see if there's another organization that already provides this information that we can access and make available to our students. So if career uh, planning was was an issue that you came up with and said, boy, we really need a course on preparing for college. Well, see, this information may be available and all you need to do is gather the information and put it in the library or make it available to the students through an assembly. I mean, we can have assemblies that, that do the same thing without necessarily identifying uh, the creation of a new course. But if we decide that a new course is needed, then the next step is to determine who among the students need the course and how many would possibly take it. And so this is where you're having to do an assessment of, of the students to see who have not mastered the content, who need the content, so you can kind of get an idea of the the real need for the course. Next, identify the content to be covered in this new course. And this means developing a list of objectives for the course. Step four involves creating a map of the sequence of the objectives and the duration each objective will be taught. And you've heard me talk about that already. Uh, step five requires that each objective have a corresponding learning activity associated with it. And see, and I like that. You know, as we're covering objectives, what's the activity that they have to uh, complete in order for them to demonstrate what they've learned. And a learning activity in this case means what the student will do to meet the objective. Could be a project, could be an assignment, uh, could be an oral presentation for that matter, or a video presentation. Step six is the creation of the instructional materials. And this is the materials that you create to facilitate the meeting of the course objectives. So don't think just lecture here. Oh, I'm going to lecture and cover the cut. No. It could be a group discussion, a debate, a special project, a poetry reading if you're teaching English. A lot of different things can be used as a learning activity 
and basically gives the students the opportunity to interact with course material. Step seven, you develop the assessments that are going to be used in the course, and this can include formative assessments as well as summative. Finally, you compile all the materials into a curriculum guide to be given to each teacher who will teach this course, and this guide then becomes their roadmap to the course. Let's sum it up, what we've been doing here for the last few minutes. We've looked at the curriculum from three perspectives. And so look at this picture here. It's called Earthrise, and it's Earth coming up in the, the distance from the surface of the moon. And if you're looking at this continuum, the program of study is furthest away from you. So imagine you're standing on the moon and you're looking off at the distance to the earth and, and it's 285,000 miles away. You're, you're seeing at this point the macro level of the earth. You can see the earth in the distance. You can make out clouds. You might be able to make out land masses from that distance, but that's all that you see. Then, as you progress a little closer to it, and you begin to make out the land masses, and you can see lights at night from Earth, and you can see the cities, and, and maybe some of the rivers, and things like that, maybe even mountain ranges, you're at the field of study level. You're at a, a, an enhanced level. But, if you really want to see things up close... To get that micro level view of curriculum, then you have to be looking at, at a course of study. And so I put that like on the surface of the moon where you're standing. That's looking at what we've done in reverse. We're looking right down at our feet. We're seeing our footprint in the lunar uh, surface. And, and then these others further out. And that's really three ways to look at curriculum, three ways to redesign it, to improve it. And one thing I didn't mention, but I think it goes without saying, is that we do need to look at what we're doing, what we're teaching on a regular basis. And some school districts do it every five years. Others uh, do it every three but we need to continually be looking at what we're doing to see if it meets one of those three purposes that the authors identified for schooling. And if it's not meeting the need, then what we need to do is update it so it does do that. Well, that kind of gives you a, a broad stroke picture of uh, improving programs, fields, and courses of study. And, and I hope that it's kind of given you the, some things to think about to how you can improve the curriculum by looking at it from these three vantage points. Have a great day.